for this great opportunity. Been looking forward to it. And thanks for thanks for making it happen. And thank you all for making the time. I think all of us tend to be continuously busy. So thank you for spending part of your day here. And I really look forward to your advice, guidance, words of wisdom, and uh, any questions. I will be happy to try to uh, to answer. So. To jump straight into it, I thought I'd start with um, this particular. Oh boy, now it says end of slide. Quit to exit. Uh, and, uh, this is one of those wonderful days. Let me try and relaunch it again. That's very strange. Patrick, don't stress. Honestly, everybody's happy to sit here and wait. It's like, <laughs> don't stress. This has happened to me before, and it's it's like there's no point in stressing. Just we You're all have, we, we all back? have to do this. Did they come back? Am I back on now? Do you know what I would do if I were you, Paul? Do you have the slides? I don't, but oh, um, Patrick, you... let's, let's try again now. Do you see the slide? Yeah. I can okay. see the industry. Let's hope it doesn't exit again when I press next slide. Anyway, I, I, um, yeah, carry on. So I thought I'd start with just this this sentence from a uh, recent uh, expert drone study of the industry, and just to read it out, you know, the, the 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 author says that we are on the very edge of exponential growth in the drone industry, and that it has the potential to transform our lives for the better. And that has got to be a, a goal worth working towards. And I certainly agree with, with the sentiment. Um, and at the same time, I think it's worth unpacking this a little bit because, for example, uh, who is the we uh, uh, on, on the edge of exponential growth? Uh, whose lives will actually be transformed for the better? Um, and actually, who will get to lead this transformation for better lives and have access to this exponential uh, technology? And who gets to be an expert and make a career uh, out of this opportunity? And having worked in the, the humanitarian technology space for a good 15 years now, it's just incredibly striking how the vast, vast majority of discussions um, on emerging technologies for social good writ large uh, tend to focus almost exclusively on what technologies to use and how best to use them. In contrast, there's virtually no discussion on who actually gets to use these technologies in the first place. And, and the reason is, one of the reasons, um, is that it's much easier to talk about uh, technical optimizations and address technical questions, and it's a less comfortable to talk about the who, because it does raise questions around uh, social injustice, uh, discrimination, and um, and so on, and so that's why you know, the vast majority of this of the humanitarian technology space has kind of shied away from that. But uh, the fact of the matter is, the, the vast majority of humanitarian technology projects in the majority world, in in the global south, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, uh, tend to be foreign led. Uh, top-down and and technocentric, and that approach doesn't always work very well. Um, it is often not sustainable. Uh, some would you could even go so far as saying most are not sustainable, and, and they do tend to be very, very technocentric um, and kind of exclude local expertise and uh, local knowledge. And in the worst cases, they absolutely create harm. And there's there's more and more evidence from decades now um, of, of the kind of harm that's been created through this kind of foreign-led, top-down, technocentric approach. And just to give you an example or a few examples to make this less abstract, uh, a while back I was invited to join a, a scoping project in a country in the Caribbean to identify drone delivery routes for a, um, a follow-up uh, cargo drone project. And uh, so I was there with a number of, of partners and going to different areas, very rural, mountainous areas. And I became a little, a little um, perplexed because the areas we were looking at, I had some of the best roads I've ever seen anywhere on the planet. 
and and it didn't seem like there was a challenge there from a from a supply chain perspective. And so when I raised the question, um, the answer was that a, a major multi-million dollar drone company from Silicon Valley had previously uh, worked with them and had chosen those delivery routes because those were the few areas where the villages were and the local clinics where there was 3G coverage. And so that, that explained a lot um, because the vast majority of those areas otherwise uh, don't have 3G coverage. And so this was uh, a little upsetting because I figured, you know, that the idea is that communities are already facing uh, the digital divide in terms of just being excluded, uh, you know, not having access connectivity uh, to the internet, to, the, to that knowledge base. And, and just because they already, you know, have this divide that is uh, impacting their lives, it's going to be compounded even even worse because now drone delivery services won't reach their communities either. So I said, well, you know, the this Silicon Valley drone company designs for Silicon Valley. They design for California. This is what they know. This is what they know best. So, you know, the drones that we have in mind uh, do not need 3G. So let's go outside the 3G coverage and let's look at for compelling public health um, uh, use cases. And at one point we got to, a, a, we were on a dirt road, uh, got to a, a, a river where the bridge had been washed, washed away uh, during the previous rainy season. And so um, the local villagers had built a makeshift bridge that was strong and, and wide enough to allow motorbikes uh, you know, uh, single file, if you'd like, to go through and people to, to walk through single file. And the suggestion there was, OK, well, here we go. There's no 3G. There's a there's a, a, a village four kilometers further down this dirt road and there is no 3G and there is no bridge. Um, so this this is a great opportunity for doing uh, drone delivery. And, and, and it felt like I was not being a very um, uh, good team player in the sense that I suggested that perhaps what we should focus on is maybe building a bridge or rebuilding the bridge uh, because the motorbikes were going in and out perfectly fine. And frankly, motorbikes uh, are better use on dirt roads in this particular case than cars anyway. So the, the, the clinic and the local village was not actually disconnected. Uh, and they completely agreed. Huh? Everybody was like, yeah, no kidding. Uh, the problem is the donor wants to fund a sexy technology emerging tech project and does not want to just have to rebuild a bridge. So um, I'm starting with some of these tensions because they're very real and and then to let you know how we're trying in our own small way to to, to manage these tensions in a in a in an ethical manner. Um, this is a picture from a, a completely different project in a different part of the world uh, in the South Pacific a while after the first project, where again, I was invited for a similar uh, opportunity. And after you know, multiple uh, workshops with uh, multiple stakeholders, they had collectively identified uh, a really compelling drone delivery route. And towards the end of the discussions, one of the stakeholders had said, you know, this is really a great route because uh, it's going to change everything because this, this road is so unsafe. And when I heard that, I said, well, do you mean like uh, accidents or, uh, I don't know, uh, landslides? And they said, no, actually, it's, it's unsafe because there are a lot of carjackings that happen along this road. And in fact, even during daylight, nobody in their right mind will get in a car by themselves without armed escort or without a convoy. And I was like, wow, and that got me thinking as well, because um, surely part of government's responsibility is to provide you know, uh, transportation infrastructure like roads and public safety uh, as well. And is there potentially a risk that governments then shirk their responsibilities by saying, oh, no, we'll go with a drone delivery corridor and then they don't have to worry about everything else. And the, the, you know, there are obviously a number of problems with that, uh, not least being that you know, roads are a public good in, in many respects, but drone corridors are not a public good. So it's messy, it's challenging. I'm not going to suggest that we have uh, any of the answers, let alone um, most of them. 
Um, so it is a, a few of the tensions that, that we've been wrestling with. And the way that we're going about managing these is by being a, a local first organization. And by that, I mean everything that we do at We Robotics uh, focuses uh, as a priority on local expertise, local knowledge, local leadership, local ownership and, and autonomy. And the way that we do that is through the Flying Labs network. Uh, and Flying Labs are local knowledge hubs. They're independently led, locally led knowledge hubs uh, now in, in 30 plus countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America and beyond. And they use, make, uh, take advantage of local expertise um, and local leadership combined with appropriate technologies to help accelerate our collective pursuit of the sustainable uh, development goals. And they're all connected with each other, uh, actively sharing best practices, lessons learned, failures, challenges, opportunities, and, and so on. So it's a, it's a very, uh, very much a connected uh, network of uh, very diverse experts from all around the world. And they're also each of them directly connected with key actors in their own countries, whether that be government, industry, universities, uh, or civil society. And to make it more real for you, obviously Flying Labs are not just dots on a map, there's some very real people uh, behind Flying Labs. I wanted to share at least some of the, the faces uh, behind the Flying Labs network. It's a really diverse uh, group of experts from very different disciplines, sectors, domains, and sets of experience, truly uh, multi-cross-disciplinary, and that really adds to the, to the value and the richness of the exchanges and the learning and impact that happens across the Flying Labs network. Now, Flying Labs are engaged in uh, multiple areas, uh, not just uh, public health and cargo drones, which is, of course, what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Just to let you know that Flying Labs are also actively involved in humanitarian action, uh, sustainable development, climate change adaptation, uh, wildlife conservation and protection, nature conservation, environmental protection, and, and more. Um, what I want to do now is just share with you a number of the different projects that uh, we've had the opportunity to work on with Flying Labs and other key partners over the past half decade now. Um, and just really stay relatively just a high level broad um, and happy to go into any amount of detail that you might be interested in during the discussions and any other calls, discussions we have uh, in the weeks and months and years that, that follow. Uh, our very first uh, cargo drone project was made possible by Peru Flying Labs, who were particularly keen in exploring whether they might be able to uh, be part of the solution in helping to improve supply chain uh, issues in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. And so they did a nine month scoping study, uh, meeting with local doctors and local hospitals and clinics, and also the Ministry of Health just to really understand might 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 drones be potentially a part of uh, of one of the challenges that uh, uh, solutions that that are needed and and the signals they received were 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 very positive and so in 2016 um, we were able to work with uh, Peru Flying Labs to do some initial flights and deliveries um, in uh, at the edge of the the Amazon rainforest well more than the edge and in the Amazon rainforest. And the, the, the first flights really focused on a 40, 40 kilometer delivery of anti-venom, which is a huge uh, poisonous snakes are a huge issue uh, in this part of the Amazon. And the challenge they have is that to reach some of these villages, the only way to do so is by canoe on these very windy uh, uh, rivers. And, and we took uh, one of these canoes to get to uh, Pampa Hermosa, which was one of those remote villages, and it, it took us close to six hours under the sun, no shade. Um, so you can imagine somebody's been bitten by a snake, putting them under the uh, sun uh, for six hours. Uh, uh, not not the best of situations. So uh, we were able to demonstrate, and, and Peru Flying Labs were very much the ones in uh, the driver's seat, 
uh, we're able to demonstrate that you know uh, a, a very simple cargo drone uh, like this one was able to do the job just just fine um, uh, and was able to deliver the anti venom in about half an hour compared to you know, six hour canoe uh, canoe boat ride uh, and but this this use of this particular drone which is a kind of a famous drone within the Flying Labs network, and I'll explain why in a minute, all, was, not, uh, in, uh, was not the plan. Uh, we had actually come in with a other company, a, uh, an American drone company, that had a $60,000 drone compared to this three dollars $4,000 drone that you see here. And after seven, eight, seven or eight days of trying to get the, their $60,000 drone to actually just take off uh, in a stable manner, uh, they gave up. They were never able to make a single flight um, with their very sophisticated, very expensive uh, cargo drone. And so luckily, Peru Flying Labs had brought some of their other drones that they had been use, using for mapping for other projects. And they figured, hey, we've got nothing to lose. Why don't we take this drone, put some anti-venom in and fly it? And uh, you know, long story short, it, it worked. Um, and entirely credit, all, all credit goes to to prove flying labs, and they have a specific nickname for this drone. They call it Frankie uh, after Frankenstein, and uh, probably self-explanatory because it's it's seen better days and it's barely holding together with with duct tape. But the point um, I want to just emphasize here, uh, the learning is that you know it does not have to look sexy; it just has to bloody work, right? It does not look have to look like a Ferrari, uh, a flying Ferrari. The key here is that it's, it, it works and that it's reliable and can be locally repaired. So those were some of the you know take homes from that first cargo drone project. And then we returned the following year with BD, a, um, a, a global medical technology company, and we greatly expanded the number of flights, the number of uh, drone routes. Uh, longest was 120 uh, kilometers, shortest was five kilometers. Uh, delivering uh, blood samples, uh, di diagnostic tests, uh, medicines, uh, you name it. And, and all of this, by the way, is written in uh, uh, extreme detail uh, uh, in, a, in a report that's available uh, publicly through our, through our website. So all the, all the challenges, all the failures, all the learnings are in that report. The next year, we were able to uh, we were invited to work in the Dominican Republic um, to provide training uh, and do some drone delivery, sort of proof of concepts, um, uh, with some partners uh, there. And then the year after that, we came back this time at the request of Pfizer, where we uh, took the M600, the Matrice 600 from DJI, which you see pictured here and engineered a cargo drone upgrade, uh, a hardware and software upgrade for the DJI M600 to basically turn it into a cargo drone. And uh, Dominican Republic Flying Labs carried out approximately 100 flights slash deliveries, fully autonomous takeoff uh, flights and, and, and landing to two regional clinic, uh, two remote clinics in, uh, in the mountains of the DR uh, and connecting that to a regional hospital in in San Juan. Uh, the technology, the training uh, was all transferred. So, you know, the flying labs are able to take the lead, have the expertise, have the technologies to operate independently in future drone delivery uh, projects. And that for us is actually the most important part and where uh, that is our mandate and more our mission than, you know, uh, having the impact on the public health. Of course, we're doing this to have an impact on public health, but our mission as an organization is to enable local experts to have the impact themselves independently um, in terms of public health outcomes. As part of this project, we also had the opportunity to test out this particular drone from Dronistics, a Swiss uh, startup. What we really liked about this drone um, is that it's extremely safe. You see this kind of exoskeleton that quickly wraps around the drone. And that really allows you to do peer-to-peer -peer deliveries. Uh, you're no longer necessarily delivering to places, you're delivering to people, to in people's arms, right? And um, we were keen to explore this particular technology and see what it, uh, what it could do and what the demand uh, might be for this kind of 
particular uh, use case. And you can learn more about our work in the Dominican Republic, thanks to DGI, who very kindly did a one of their DGI uh, stories on, on this particular project. So you can find that online. Moving now to a completely different part of the world, in Nepal, uh, we had the opportunity of working with a Nepali public health, or an outstanding Nepali public health organization on a TB project. Um, and they're basically, uh, Nepal Flying Labs, again, like all our projects, um, had got received the training, uh, the technology transfer, and carried out um, over a uh, thousand uh, sputum samples for rapid TB testing um, from uh, eight remote clinics in the foothills of the Himalayas and, and flying them back to two regional hospitals for rapid testing. And they did this over the course of, of half a year. Pandemic kind of got in the way, but they're in the process of, of rebooting and the, they're hoping uh, to expand the delivery routes um, uh, funding uh, permitted. And just to give you a sense of the original project with these eight uh, remote clinics, the, the Majkot uh, Health Post there is one of those clinics. And so you can see the orange line is the road and you can see from the video the kind of the, the, the this is the road, this is the reality. And so on a good day, it takes uh, about four hours to, to, get, to get to the health post from Pewtown Hospital. And of course, if it rains, they don't even try, they don't even bother. Um, so if you're going to do a you know return trip, uh, deliver medicines, and then come back with the patient samples, you're basically got your whole day is taken up. And in contrast with the um, the drone flight route, which is barely 10 kilometers, um, you're getting the drone in in seven minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, that was uh, basically the the times that they were clocking. So that's a, you know, that's a significant uh, significant difference there. And again, all you know, all these flights over a half a year period, done entirely by uh, Nepali experts with the technology owned by them. We also were involved in and continue to be involved in a really exciting project with the World Mosquito Program. Very different kind of uh, cargo drone project in the sense that it's more of a of a aerial release project. Uh, where uh, the World Mosquito Program basically releases Wolbachia mosquitoes, um, and I can go into more details later, um, that prevent the transmission of dengue fever. And so we did this project in, uh, over multiple years in Fiji with the flying labs there, who took the lead in operating the drone. And we developed the release mechanism that you see here, it looks like a simple box, but it's actually not trivial engineering inside. It uh, carries several hundred thousand uh, mosquitoes at a very chilled temperature, and then is able to release 150 mosquitoes at any given time, all autonomous and drone optimized and so on. And uh, independent peer reviewed studies have shown that uh, we had a statistically significant impact on the reduction of dengue uh, the incidence of dengue in, in that part of Fiji as a result of this particular dimension. So now we're working on um, scaling this um, through uh, uh, an updated uh, platform uh, release mechanism so that we can do this more at, at scale uh, across the Flying Labs network. Uh, more recently, earlier this year, we had the opportunity of working with uh, the Gates Foundation uh, and the World Health Organization on a polio project to uh, explore how to Ultimately, the project was focused on helping WHO make better use or make actual use of existing drone delivery networks in Africa, um, uh, specifically from the point of view of polio uh, sample transportation. And so we had the opportunity of working with Madagascar Flying Labs and Aerial Metric, a um, Madagascar uh, French uh, cargo drone company, um, doing a month's worth of uh, pickups of, uh, of simulated samples. And with p polio, you have to actually have cold chain. You have to be uh, no more than eight degrees Celsius, uh, ideally. And so cold chain was important. So uh, this was done over a month to three, collecting uh, patient samples from three clinics, cold chain and so on, all successful thanks to, thanks to the partners in Madagascar. And, and after this project, WHO said, okay, well, okay, you can do about, you know, these deli the deliveries within about a 30 kilometer radius, that's all fine and well, but what happens to the cold chain if you have to do a 100 kilometer delivery? 
And we said, that's a fantastic question. Let's find out. And uh, just a month or so ago, um, we did up to 225 uh, kilometer drone delivery, entirely cold chain. We're able to maintain the cold chain uh, throughout the, the flight. Um, and you'll see the video online as well, but that just gives you, that was the, the 225 uh, kilometer drone flight with the samples inside uh, with the cold chain. And we had the temperature sensor you know, collecting the readings as well. So that was exciting to, to see happen. Um, and we did a, basically did a, a very similar project on purpose um, in Ghana with Ghana Flying Labs and Zipline because the idea again was to help catalyze WHO's use of, of drone delivery networks and to introduce them to different models, right? So aerial metric, VTOL, uh, you know, outbound medicines, inbound samples, uh, they uh, have very mobile drone ports, uh, requires little, very little infrastructure, very little resources. And then in contrast, we have Zipline, which we all know about. Um, and so we wanted to do a very similar study uh, of, of a full month's worth of, of deliveries of, of the patient samples and same same data being collected in terms of performance, flight times, cold chain, cost benefit analysis, comparative analysis, and so on. And then we we did a, a, a full comparative study between the insights and the data from Madagascar and the insights and data from, from, from Ghana. And we're now waiting for WHO to let us uh, publish all our findings like we always have done very publicly and transparently, but they have to give us the green light. Um, you may have potentially seen this article in the UK Guardian uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we are actually, you know, we being Uganda Flying Labs and we Robotics are actually the technical um, operational partner for this particular project. We will be using the M300 for which we are engineering a cargo drone upgrade that will enable us and Uganda Flying Labs and our partners in Uganda to use this platform both for mapping data collection um, as well as cargo to deliver HIV medicines between uh, a number of islands in Lake Victoria. Uh, we are not making this public, by the way, our, ourselves at We Robotics. Uh, we will wait until we have meaningful results and something to show and some lessons to share. And we hope that we'll be able to do that um, in about six months time. OK, uh, just to close up now and, and wrap up, just to maybe sum up, you know, our own approach to drone delivery. It's not doesn't with no suggestion that it's the best approach. It's just a approach that we have gravitated towards with uh, Flying Labs based on the learnings that we've had with with Flying Labs. You know, we focus, like, it's no surprise, on local ownership and independence, the full autonomy, and we're completely, te you know, technology agnostic. We'll use with what Ever technology is the most appropriate. Um, we're we're extremely committed to openly sharing data, insights, and failures, and we prioritize two-way drone delivery. Um, and also, we we focus on uh, smaller communities, smaller rural, more dispersed uh, communities, because our concern is that potentially they get left out of the more mainstream drone deliveries, um, the very high frequency national scale uh, drone deliveries, which is not to mean that those national scale deliveries are not important. Obviously they are. Uh, it's very complementary. You can think of, you know, we're, we're working on the back roads uh, and maybe some of the big players are working on the big, you know, aerial highways uh, in the sky. And, and we're, we're, we're very interested in the smaller back roads, uh, which means that we're interested in you know, how do you come up with a model, technical and business model, um, uh, to provide medium to low frequency deliveries? Uh, how do you make that viable? And we're very interested in drone ports being nimble and mobile and uh, incubating uh, locally owned startups, um, which we've done with a number of flying labs um, over the years. Um, and we have actually an exciting update to share in the coming weeks on that with respect to cargo drones. Um, and voila, you can learn a lot more you know, online. Um, and just to end, you know, we are not a company. We're not a drone company. We're a, a not-for-profit organization and a very small not-for-profit organization. So we don't focus on building drones. We will 
a focus on on modifying drones and and, and engineering add-ons, but we're not building drones. And for for cargo drone technology itself, we partner with with industry leaders. Uh, and and in in our particular case right now, we have formal partnerships with AV in the Netherlands, Windcopter in uh, Germany, and Aerial Metric in uh, Madagascar. And we are continuously scoping other cargo drone companies in Africa and India as well. Um, we have a report out that's available uh, on uh, how drones have been used, uh, cargo drones have been used at, in terms of the COVID response. And last but not least, we also have a fully peer-reviewed online course on the use of uh, drone delivery for public health that you can also check out. So that's it for me. Thanks for your patience. Um, back to you, Paul. Patrick, that was absolutely fantastic very very good now in the in the chat we've got some some really nice questions and 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 i and i want to give the questions a, a really good I, I, want, I want to do them do, uh, justice so could i could i invite um deirdre would you like to to ask you've got a, a a very set of specific questions about um delivery in south american countries and and, and, I, and I don't know whether you know patrick so if if you don't, if you could tell Patrick who you are, that, that would be even better. <laughs> okay. Hi, Patrick. Really good Hi. presentation. Thank you very much. So my name is Dee Dee Wallace and I'm the Health and Care Innovation Lead at Oxfordshire County Council in the UK. And um, we are involved in several drone projects. One that is at the moment um, that it involves um, uh, delivery of acute meds um, between a pharmacy and a rural care home location. So it's a proof of concept one time flight. So I'm really, really interested to see everything that you've been talking about. And I immediately because everything for me right now in my brain is COVID, COVID, COVID. You know, it's like, how do we get the stuff around, you know, so that life can get back to normal if whatever normal is. So I was really interested when you were talking um, about South American countries and also about Nepal, about the work that you've been doing in those two places and whether you've been able to make any inroads with um, whatever their equivalent of a vaccine task force is there. And if so, um, you know, if the will is there, does the infrastructure um, allow for it, for the drones to get to where they need to go? And that's my question. Thanks, dude. That's that's a great question, and great to hear about about your work in, um, in Oxfordshire as well. Um, I'm always trying to learn from others, so this is perfect. Um, um, uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of interest. We had a uh, we had a kind of like experts. It sounds a little too grandiose, but a meeting with uh, donors and key high level stakeholders from the um, Nepali government back in April, uh, like a two and a half hour co creation workshop with them and and yeah a, a few high, a few donors and the, the the need is there the use cases are there for, for in terms of the covid response in terms of them delivering the vaccines um it, it the you know the expertise is already in nepal um we could bring in longer range drones as as needed it's it's a question of funding um so uh there you know so things are in motion whether that will lead to then funding that will enable Nepal Flying Labs and uh, the, the key public health stakeholders in Nepal to, to move forward. You know, I, it's, it's unfortunately not in, in my hands, but we're continuing to lobby. Yeah, I think it's like something that I think when it comes to the COVID response, I think uh, everybody on this call, definitely, we're all innovators or we wouldn't be sitting here, you know? And we tend to work like, all of us in that space that's so far ahead of of the curve of what people decision makers understand is reality so my big hope out of the pandemic is if we can't get this stuff in motion right now because you know the time is really really tight that delivery models like this using drones be it for medical supplies vaccines whatever will form the part of any future kind of pandemic preparedness planning because I don't think it's our last tango. So sorry guys. Right on. Totally agreed. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the great presentation as well. Brilliant. Really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a, a Alexis who's who's asked a, a cracking question. Lots of technical stuff. Alexis, are you there? 
Alex. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi, Patrick. Uh, hey. We've spoken before. Oh, hi there. Yeah, it was just a question, really. The first track my event mentioned, obviously, about the costs, you know, external bodies funding it rather than being self-sustaining and Nigeria being the first one of its kind to do that, where it's part of the actual healthcare budget. Are you finding that lower TRLs is the way forward? I know you've mentioned DGI and AV and so on, which are slightly more expensive platforms, in order to make this a sustainable reality. And the question as well is, doing these long-range flights, I assume there's no real detect and avoid function. It's very much uh, long-range, hope we don't hit anything. Or is there a point where, if you scale this sufficiently, you would need to start having to worry about those kinds of aspects? Great questions. Um, great questions. So on, uh, let's see, cost and... Um, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Did you want to say something? No, 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 no. I'm just listening. Oh. I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> So uh, cost, yes. I mean, you know, ever since we found ourselves, you know, in the middle of the Amazon rainforest uh, half a decade ago, uh, and learning, uh, you know, by doing with uh, thanks to our Peruvian partners, it, it's it's. I'm surprised, or maybe maybe it's naive, uh, that it's been five years and there's still. I think there's a market opportunity for an affordable cargo drone. Um, and the, I don't know that we found one yet. Uh, it's not, it, it, I, it's, and, and there's, there are probably a lot of good reasons. I just, this is not my area of expertise. I don't, and I don't, I don't run a drone company, build drones or anything else. Um, but it's a little unfortunate. And, you know, at one point when, you know, at, at the end of the, that first project in the Amazon, when we saw Frankie do its thing, uh, we're like, okay, so maybe we should look at just repurposing existing drones you know mapping drones have been around for far longer they're more robust uh, they have more of a track record uh they're more affordable what if we just went down that route or do we wait five years three years or whatever it is uh, until industry produces a drone that is affordable and reliable and we decided on the former obviously from what you saw from the presentation because we figured well frankly at the end of the day at most 10 percent of cargo drone projects is the drone technology, for better or worse. Uh, everything else, the 90% of the regulations, the training, the flight routes, the community engagement, the uh, media, I mean, it's just, there's so much else that goes on into that. So we figured, you know what, let's, let's already get that 90% figured out. And that way, when new drones come in, you just swap the 10% with a new drone. Um, but yeah, uh, it's still not there, and that's why you know we decided to work with the M600. That's why now, thanks to Pfizer, we're working with the M300. Um, is to do our very best to, to to keep those costs low, and they absolutely make a difference, because especially in the areas that that we in Flying Labs work in, which are rural areas where you have municipalities that don't have the kind of funding. To say, oh yeah, we'll 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 put fifty thousand dollars into a drone, uh, as opposed to a medication. It, it's it just doesn't work. So that is the 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 cost of the drone, is still a big uh, barrier, um, and again, that's why we're gravitating towards you know those those platforms. Um, Wingcopter is not <laughs> not an, a particularly affordable uh, affordable drone, um, but it has advantages that you know uh, obviously that that like the that the multi rotors we're using simply don't. Um, uh, so it's not that you know there's one uh, one ring to rule them all, um, and that's why we're actively, you know, creating partnerships with diverse uh, companies so that flying labs have a whole toolbox to choose from, um, and that they're not forced of trying to force uh, to square the circle on the collision avoidance. Again, uh, you know, all these flights, all these projects, by the way, full permission from the re relative um, respective uh, CAAs. Huh? This was everything is completely above board with their full full buy-in and and so on and and I think one of the reasons we've had that kind of buy-in, well, thanks to the flying labs and their professionalism, and, and another is because th those projects are in very rural area uh, areas. There's no air traffic, <laughs> um, and and so I think that's why also the the authorities are saying, yeah, no, that that's fine, and they in some cases have not required us to have collision avoidance or telemetry and so on, but. You know, if if they do, then then we have to we have to uh, abide by 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 the regulations. So sorry, I'm taking too long answering these questions. So I'll make them shorter 
so we can get more questions in. Um, no, Patrick, that's that's really a really thorough answer. I mean, uh, uh, Alex is just fantastic at asking these questions and, and winkling out the key issues, which was good. And and for everybody, I think Alex has put a really good link into the chat. So I'm, I'm very up for putting those things in. But I just wanted to go to a, a, a really nice uh, question from uh, Sarah. Are you there, Sarah? Uh, hi. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was, it was uh, re related to what you mentioned about 3G and the tension between using already made drones and engineering them and then the other solution, which is locally made um, drones, which are maybe more sustainable. I, I wonder whether you envision uh, the likes of DJI actually developing technology that's less reliant on 3G. And I was, I was thinking particularly, um, I'm from Malawi originally, based in Oxfordshire, and early results of the Malawi pilot had many challenges with flying over Lake Malawi because of loss of 3G. So I wonder whether you think the likes of DJI will develop an alternative to 3G, basically. That is a great question. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And I'm also happy to connect you to Malawi Flying Labs if ever that's of um, of interest. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not entirely. I. So I'm not a technical uh, person, uh, and uh, I don't. I'm not sure what the. I don't know. Um, they're. They've been a solid partner. Um, um, uh, you know, with the fact that they were our very first tech, uh, technology partner to come on board. Um, I don't. I don't know what. I'm not sure. I don't have a. Unfortunately, don't have insights on their, on their R and D. I, I, if I were to guess, and I'm really not the right. I don't have. This is not my area of expertise. So disclaimer. I, I, I think there's wishful thinking, and I want to say yes, but then I'm thinking to myself, but that's not where I think the trends are going. I think the regulators are going to make this uh, across the board absolutely required, um, and so I don't. Yeah, sorry, Sarah. I'm not. It's a great question. No, I don't know. <laughs> that's great, and, and I will take you up on the offer to connect to uh, Flying Labs in Malawi. Thank you. Perfect. I'll just put my email address in the chat again in case. Um, Brilliant. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I've got, I, I'm going to indulge myself here because I'm, I'm kind of the chair, so I can ask a cheeky question. I, I, I love the gaffer tape. That was brilliant. The, 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 the one that limped home was the one that worked. But, but, but something that, 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 that Patrick Courtney and I are interested in, and he's the other originator from this, right. is, is thinking about the material properties of these aircraft. And what's really pleasing is, is you're really pushing the envelope in number of flights. Can you comment on, do you, do, do you, you know, every thousand trips, so many hours, do you, do you interrogate your drone to make sure the, the rotors are still okay? You know, can you, can you comment on that? That's a really good question um, from, from both you and Patrick. Uh, so, you know, preventive maintenance, I think as it's called in the aviation industry, very much applies obviously to to drones um i think we've we've um we've been uh less engaged in that for for the simple reason that our flights are not high frequency deliveries you know i think it's when you get to the levels of doing several thousand deliveries a a, a year or a month um that uh that this becomes extremely important because obviously there's wear and tear and you need to start, you know, uh, replacing the, the the motors and the props and whatever it is, um, uh, you know, just like happens in the aviation industry. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we don't have, you know, we've asked. We, I think this was probably very naive of us. We asked DJI for some performance uh, uh, data on the M600 and the M300. And they're like, yeah, it's business intelligence. There's no way in the heck they would show, show that outside of that. Uh, of DJI, maybe with regulators and so on, but they're not going to share with a tiny little NGO they've never heard of. Um, so, so, but, but I do think that you know I, this is a really good question because that's where it's headed. Um, I think fleet management, uh, and not just the aircraft, uh, but the battery management and all that, you know, we're going to see kind of. I think we're going to see that explode. I think we're going to get to like a, you know, it's going to become a big data issue if you'd like. Um, and it's going to be absolutely essential because it's not, because we're going to be talking about doing what, you know, Zipline is doing. It's you know, several hundred uh, deliveries or thousands per day now. So, um, so yeah, we haven't had that need. Uh, and again, our core focus is really on building 
um, long-term local expertise in countries so that then they take the lead in doing the long-term kind of projects. And again, I'm going to ask one last question. How do you go about making contact with those with those great uh, groups of, of technicians and, and 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 people that want to engage? I mean, the, 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 how does that work? I mean, uh, the, yeah. So you mean like specifically like the, the flying labs? Yeah. How, I mean, uh, yeah. How do you gather the interest up and and, and what do you do to, to create a new one? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, we thought we would have to do like you know, very proactive uh, 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 recruitment and, and and all that, and and we haven't. <laughs> um, uh, and the reason is, so we started with you know uh, as a as a pure you know pilot project uh, with with three labs. We got a, a, our first grant from the Gates Foundation back in 2016, and they said, right, you have a one year grant try out your this flying labs model that you have and see what how it, how it fares in reality and we you know we have continued to learn a lot every month thanks to flying labs um, and so the first three were, were the first one was nepal then tanzania and then peru and it was delivered that you know we wanted different parts of the world uh, uh, and so on um, and what we did not expect within just like 6 months of starting projects uh, and there, there we did like recruiting the teams, right? Um, we had contacts in Nepal and Tanzania, so that we had something to, a base to start off with. Uh, Peru was a result of a tweet, um, but uh, so we started with that, and then you know we were going back to the drawing board on a you know, almost weekly basis with this flying labs model. I mean, it looks nothing today what it looked like five years ago. Um, and so we were trying to figure it out, and and but we were getting folks from all parts of the world saying, "Ah, oh, we want a flying labs, we want a flying labs," and we had to say, "Sorry, we have no idea what a flying labs is yet." <laughs> and um, but you know, we we were so um, touched, I guess is the word. Like we were yeah. like, "Wow, people are interested," you know. And uh, and so finally, in 2018, uh, two years later, uh, we we were ready to say that there was the basis of a model we knew that part you know it had worked um and we opened it up and we said right anybody who's interested here are the requirements here are the criteria expectations blah 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 uh created the framework the model and put it out there and then it went from four labs with three labs at, at, at early early 2018 to you know over 30 labs at the end of last year uh, in 2020. Wow, 2020. 30. Yeah, That's so, <laughs> so there's demand, right? Um, and it's all demand driven. We yeah. don't say, oh, you will build a flying labs. It, it, and frankly, if we did, it would, it would fail. So it has to be demand driven. It has to be locally owned from the start. So yeah, does that help? It, the work's yeah. gotten around, um, basically. That was very good. Um, uh, Alex, to come back with, a, with another cracking question. Alex, would you like to pose that one? Um, yeah, I can Paul. I mean, it's just really a case of, this is obviously flying labs stroke to drugs, but how are you integrating directly in, into the actual medical pathways? So, you know, I'm thinking from obviously a cliched Western research, if you had, you know, a drone, is it is it a separate thing? A journey to a hospital, do you have to walk, you know, a couple hundred metres to get to a take off and landing site? How, you know, how, how close are you working kind of the medical integration aspects, for example, versus, or if it's not needed in, in, in most places, actually, it doesn't matter if it's a man walking out that sort of that sort of thing really that's a great question it, it you know this um we don't make we we don't make those decisions ourselves either we robotics or flying labs it's the public health partners um and so you know in in peru um there was in the amazon rainforest there was surprisingly enough space in these different remote villages uh to land a fixed wing a fixed wing drone, the, the, the expensive drone, the $60,000 drone that, that company that had come with us uh, was a VTOL aircraft because we wanted to just be able to then potentially, if needed, land in tight spaces. But in, um, but it, but it, it turned out that there was plenty of space and, and uh, the, um, there was no requirement given to us either from the regional hospital or the road clinics that, that we had to land on their doorstep. In contrast, in the Dominican Republic, 
And in Nepal, the public health partner said, basically, the, the drone has to take off and land from the rooftop of the hospitals and the clinics. Uh, that's the safest. It's uh, then just a matter of walking down the stairs and getting the samples or the, the, uh, the, the medicines and, and so on. And so that, you know, made us realize, okay, well, fixed wings is obviously not going to work in DR or Nepal. And that was part of the decision that informed our, a part of the information that informed a decision to go with the M600 so that we could uh, do, you know, precision landing uh, in very tight spaces on these rooftops. Um, and that works really well for obvious reasons. Um, it doesn't add yet another, you know, uh, you know, put land the drone, put the, the medicine in a car or in the back of a tuk-tuk or whatever it is, drive three kilometers, and then you're at the hospital. Um, but in some cases, that that's necessary. Uh, maybe from a regulatory perspective, you can't land that close into the city or whatever. But um, So it all depends on the public health experts themselves, the partners, they decide that. that Fantastic, Patrick, and, and thank you, uh, Alex, for, for, and Deirdre, and Ev and Sarah as well for tremendous questions. I, I've just been enthralled, and of course, I've completely forgotten about time because we've got to do some housekeeping things as well. So, Patrick, please stay on. Um, yes. But uh, but I'm gonna I'm, I'm there's, there's one point I've put in the chat uh, that uh, the Patrick uh, Courtney's nicely reminded me. Don't forget the drones for medicine delivery and healthcare logistics special issue in the journal Drones. Um, and you know we're still open for papers. So if anybody's got some some really nice data, some perception pieces, some things about technology, I mean some of the stuff that you've presented today, Patrick, you know, if we can get a few figures out of that, they they would make some very very nice papers as well. So so don't don't forget that. Um, we did do our little survey, and I'm going to pinch the screen now, if I may. Um, and we've got some 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 responses there. So. Let's hit share. So, sorry, Patrick, I'm, you're going to disappear now. Um, so, can everybody see my screen? I've got a, a screen that, that's, that's giving a, a little bit of uh, background to uh, the uh, DRACMA network. Can you see that? Yeah, I've got a nod from Patrick. So, one of, one of the key responses that I picked up from that uh, survey monkey that we did was one or two of you quite rightly said, well, what's the goal? What's the point of DRACMA? And I'm, I'm just sort of reminding you here that it came out of a, an application to the EPSRC where we were trying to develop a healthcare network to link technologists, engineers to the healthcare sector with a need. Quite focused on the UK and Europe, Norman, Northern Hemisphere issues, urban stuff, but making sure that we've, we're, we're improving the access to medicines for the whole community. So some of the user cases we mentioned were around, a, 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 you know, concerning people that were, you know, um, uh, sofa uh, couch surfing where they had no fixed abode and trying to keep up with their um, uh, medicines delivery. Pieces around COVID and isolation and, and cancer patients that were immunosuppressed. So exactly what Deirdre was talking about earlier on, getting medicines to people. So not not across the the hundred uh, kilometres that you were doing, Patrick, across the sort of two or three kilometres and that kind of thing. So our general aim was to create a, some new research collaborations, get people talking, um, and develop drone technologies. We've kind of concentrated um, so far in meetings because that's the first step to get people talking, breaking down barriers, learning some of the new findings and getting people's ideas about the future, which we've just done. But if we have a look at the other ones, we're going to start to hopefully develop some research frameworks. And I think in some of the future meetings, I would like to develop um, some pieces around where we can start to get a few research ideas and Patrick absolutely fantastic one of them we need a, a slightly better um, low to mid price uh, cargo drone perhaps you know um, that could be something that could be a driver there and again objectives around looking at um, knowledge gaps um, highlighting the thing that I've picked up especially UK America Europe's kind of pieces there's lots of pilot studies but they don't seem to be very self-sustaining can we understand some of those some of those barriers so you know we've we've flown some nice things to the isle of wight but we're not doing it regularly so is there some learnings from the stuff that you're doing patrick that we could then incorporate into some of those projects yeah and and and, and use the best practice that you've highlighted there um 
We want to raise awareness of the potential for drone technologies to deliver to the point of care. I think that's something we haven't quite done yet because we're all talking about people that are, are, are dronophiles. <laughs> and, and, and can we can we get out to some of our um, you know, uh, communities, patient groups and healthcare providers? Um, I, th I think especially around particular diseases, particular areas and things that are, are not too, you know, you, that you wouldn't expect. I mean, you know, emergency medicine, the stuff that Shell presented, very, very interesting, you know, delivering de defibrillators to city centres or golf courses, you know, trying to get to, you know, you've got a nine minute window in terms of, of, of surviving a heart attack. And I think the survival rates are down at 10 to 20 percent, you know, that kind of thing there. And then develop further funding applications. So I think the, the first three things there key into that. And I believe one or two members in the community already have, have put in some joint applications, which is just fantastic. I'm going to ask very kindly if you could feed back some of that. I don't need details of the grant, you know, that's probably covered by IP, but a title, where did you apply? That would be really, really useful. Um, we did our little uh, survey monkey and, and every, you know, half the group thinks it's ex excellent and the rest of the group think it's very good, which is very pleasing. Um, one of the things that came about was, I don't think we've got the timing quite right because we've got our West Coast colleagues that we're not quite picking up. And um, we've got uh, Gabriella from, I think it's, is it Up Dog, Up Doc? Um, the group that's come out of, uh, of, of Village Reach. And she would like to talk to us um, next month around data collection. And that's something that came out of your work, Patrick. We've got lots of these missions. How do we capture all that data? So we've got a great bank in terms of then other people could use it to actually leapfrog some of the learnings that other people have got and also use that for modeling things as well. So she's going to come and talk to us about that. So one for the diaries. I think I'd like to push it to about two o'clock in the UK to be more inclusive. So I'm going to put some email warnings about that. Um, people like the once a month, which was good. Um, current format was 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 well um, accepted as well. Things that I've got to do is um, and the group is we've got to develop a, a website and a, and a Twitter account. We're very very kind of meetings based, and possibly those kind of things will then start to get the community thinking about um, you know more joint applications and that kind of thing. And these are the questions that dropped out at the end. So I, I think we've kind of covered the goal business. Yes, we've got some nice meetings, but we've got to think about developing some other ways in terms of our, you know, online teams meetings to get more sharing, to get more ideas about some some funding and some strategy there. Um, people quite like it. They quite like the frequency. Um, and I think there's a there's, there's a job for Patrick and I is that we've got to develop a, a five minute little little kind of overview of what Dragmar is about. So I think we're there. I mean, I've overrun by about four minutes, so I do apologize. Are there any points um, that the group would like to to sort of comment on from my little overview of the results of the survey? It's all gone very quiet because people are itching for their lunches, possibly. No, I think I think I've got some I've got I've got some nice comments in the chat. Uh, Alex is telling us that we should uh, encourage future NH NHS uh, collaboration and NHS SX. These are the um, the sort of innovate group of 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 the National Health Service. Um, COVID presents so many opportunities dealing with that. That's from from Deirdre. And possibly we could dedicate one of the Dragmar meetings to perhaps COVID and see if we've got some presenters that want to give their drone specific solutions around the COVID piece. Um, I started to think about phase three future f flight for autumn to create UK consortium around user case. So this is Michelle Carter from the KTN um, and, and seeing if this kind of approach is scalable, which is very good. So we'll carry on having some conversations there. Um, and if you want to have a look at local authorities, look at the Civita Glo Global. Alex, that's a really good point. Do you have a, a, a web link you could put in the chat for that? Is there, a, is, is, is there a link there? Perhaps the other group would, the other members of the group would would like that. Is Alex still here? Can I see an AK? I can see an AK. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Alex. So um, 
I think we're there because the idea is to keep it to an hour because we've all got huge, great, um, uh, you know, sort of demands on our timetabling and time. But Patrick, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for making the time. Um, one thing I would like to do is is perhaps I'm going to send you details of the next meeting. Uh, and if you could um, uh, disseminate that through some of your labs, that would be that would be really useful because really want people at the sharp end that have used these things day in, day out to, 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 to be involved and come up with some of their comments, best practice and that kind of thing, which is good. So I think we're there. I'm going to say tata. I am sorry about some of the technical issues. I've it's not as slick as usual because my team's wasn't uh, was doing funny things and i think patrick you had some some issues at the start but we got there at the end and if you can give us a couple of hours we'll be posting up the um uh the video so i'm going to turn my camera back on because i've forgotten to switch it on so i'm going to say goodbye to everybody goodbye from sunny norfolk and and hopefully everything's well in 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 switzerland and um see you next time thank you Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.